for most of his seven decades of monitoring those who wielded power in Washington, Izzy Stone, the independent, self-published journalist, was regularly criticized by those of us in the establishment media. And it was a great joy to most of us who were inspired by Izzy when these critics would be embarrassed to learn that the documents that Izzy was basing his publication on were documents that they either had never heard of or hadn't bothered to read before Izzy called them to their attention. His son Jeremy created the uh, Eye of Stone medal to hold up for greater public attention such deeply reported work by other highly independent journalists. To do his work, Izzy immersed himself in a deep reading of the official record. Laura Portress immerses herself in the lives of her subjects. There is, she says, an emotional divide between what we intellectually know about the world and how we feel about that knowledge. I try to close that divide. As a result of her efforts, she has created a body of reporting that meticulously addresses the complex and political issues and realities of our, our time by way of deeply told personal stories, stories that connect us emotionally to what we would otherwise only know as abstract issues. When Laurie Conway, herself a documentary filmmaker, nominated Laura, she cited several of Laura's films that were conceived to record America's reaction to the September 11, 2001 attack on the World Trade Center. One of those films, My Country, My Country, is set in Iraq in the aftermath of the American invasion of that country to show us, the Iraqi people, as they attempted to rebuild themselves and their nation. And she chose to do this by embedding herself in the family of a doctor as he was treating the Iraqi people and dealt with their shattered minds, their shattered bodies, and their shattered lives. It was a film that George Packer, writing in The New Yorker, called a masterpiece of empathy. Another of these films was The Oath, filmed in Yemen and Guantanamo Bay, to immerse all of us in the stories of Abu Jandal, the bodyguard for Osama bin Laden, and Salim Hamdan, so that we could all see the depth and brutality of America's treatment of those that it had taken prisoner during our country's multiple military engagements in the Middle East. It was work such as this that led to a phone call that would bring Laura to even wider public attention. Why choose me, she asked Edward Snowden when he, she received his first phone call. You chose yourself, he said, <laughs> citing her films. To cope with the unprecedented scope of secret documents that Snowden then proceeded to offer her, Laura organized the team that included Glenn Greenwald and Bart Gelman to turn the material and documents into articles that would run in the New York Times, I mean in the Washington Post and The Guardian, and to produce Citizen Four, her box office film hit, to expose all of us to the unparalleled extent of American spying on its own people and focus our minds on the extent to which September the 11th, 2001 had changed the world we live in. A.O. Scott spoke for many of us in his review of Citizen Four when he wrote in the New York Times, 
For Portress, what gave the story gravity was Snowden. For me, it was Portress herself. From the first, I was sucked into the narrative in a way I have never experienced before and probably will never experience again. At a time, <clears throat> at a time when the internet gives us all access to more unlimited information, but a time when the documented, verified information on which a democratic society depends is declining, the nature and the content of Laura's work is what this medal was created to recognize, and it's my privilege to present the 2014 I. F. Stone Medal to Laura Fortress. Um, it's really an honor to receive this award, and I'd like to thank the, the Neiman Foundation and Izzy's family, and it's an incredible honor to receive it alongside um, of the award that you've given Amy Goodman, whose work it, we are all um, inspired by and rely upon on a daily basis to know what's happening in the world and to know what to care about, and her capacity both for compassion for the, the work that she covers and her intellectual ver voraciousness <laughs> is so inspiring. And, and so it's wonderful to be here, be here with her. Um, I, I really can't accept this award without also acknowledging um, my dear friend and brilliant colleague, Glenn Greenwald, without whom none of this reporting would have been possible. And with, and and who is the person who, if I could choose to be on the front lines of any fight, it would be with Glenn. So I'm glad he's on my side because I really would not want to be his adversary. Um, so when I received um, a notification about this about this award, I was you know deeply honored, and I was also a little bit surprised. And I was surprised because. Unlike I.F. Stone, who is an extraordinary writer, I actually don't consider myself a writer at all. The work that I do is, is I use images to, to do the reporting. And, and I have actually a lot of feelings about how words work and how words actually fail us. Um, uh, my, I, I, this, the body of work that I've been working on now in terms of documenting post-9-11 America was to try to reconcile what, what the information that we were getting and our failure to actually respond to it in any kind of a human or emotional way. And uh, I made the decision to go to Iraq and, and make a film about the war there, the war, because I was reading the newspaper and we were reading about body counts and we had no idea who these bodies were. Um, and we, it, we weren't interrupted in any way. Our daily life wasn't interrupted in any way. And so I wanted to see if there was a way to sort of change that and to document it. And, and all of the work I've been doing in, is in visual journalism is both to create a primary document. I'm interested in recording history. Um, there's nothing I'd rather do than being in the field with my camera and recording. Um, and then also to... Um, as Bill said, to sort of bridge the gap between what we know and what we feel and try to collapse that so that we can care a bit more and ultimately have more empathy for the world in which we live. Um, so in, in terms of my relationship with words, I'm actually, I don't actually do, love to do public speaking. Um, so I'm, I'm going to show a few clips and, uh, today and, and frame it. And I was thinking about how, how to talk about um, uh, my work today, and I thought... But the most important thing that I think that I have Stone represents is what Amy talked about, which is his independence and the need for independence in, in the journalism that, that we do. And, and I think that and there's been a lot written about the reporting that's happened um, that Glenn and I have done in the Snowden Archive and others, including Barton Gelman. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of talk about how essential it was that we actually were coming from it from an independent 
perspective, that we were independent journalists who had been approached by Edward Snowden, and how that fact changed what happened and in terms of how the reporting unfolded. Um, I'm going to show uh, a short clip that um, is in the beginning of my film, Citizen Four, where it, it sets up um, uh, Glenn Greenwald in the story and his work as an independent journalist. And this was recorded, actually, it was the first shoot I did on the film was in Rio in 2011. I was really interested in this person who was off the grid doing this incredible reporting and, and calling power to account. And I just went down there and uh, uh, just feeling that there was something urgent happening with this man and all of his dogs. Question of independently verifying what the government is doing. That's why I keep going back to that question. More with David Sirota after CBS News Traffic and Weather on KKZM Thornton Denver Boulder AM7. Hey, can you hear me? I am here, David. How are you? Well, I would just point, start by pointing to what Barack Obama himself said about those questions when he was running for the office that he now occupies. In December of 2007, he said, quote, the president does not have the power under the Constitution to unilaterally authorize a military attack in a situation that does not involve stopping an actual or imminent threat to the nation. So by Obama's own words, the president does not have the power that he's now exercising under the Constitution. And as far as why it matters, in, on August 1st, 2007, when he laid out his reasons why he was running for office and why he thought it was so important to change the way we were doing things, he said, quote, no more ignoring the law when it's inconvenient. That is not who we are. We will again set an example for the world that the law is not subject to the whims of stubborn rulers. So to allow presidents to simply start wars on their own without any You asked why I picked you. I didn't. You did. So, I mean, I think actually if, um, if I have Stone had been with us, I think Edward Stone might have actually reached out to him instead of Glenn or I, but, um, but he wasn't, so we, we actually are the ones who got the, got the call. And what happened for me, I mean, I was actually based in, in Berlin when I got the first. It was actually an email, not a, not a phone call. Um, and it was, I think, an unusual circumstance for a story of this magnitude. This is sort of the origins of it. It's an independent filmmaker in Berlin. I'd chosen to go there because of, I'd been stopped at the border so many times. I needed to find a place to work where I didn't have to worry about my footage being taken at the border. And then I started receiving these emails. And the, I, the magnitude of what he was saying was not lost on me. I knew that this was going to be a massive story if it turned out to be a legitimate source. Uh, but I wasn't sitting there in, in Berlin with a, with a newsroom behind me or a legal team behind me. Um, and I needed to sort of navigate how to, how to um, do this reporting in a way, who to partner with, and, and how to do this, re this reporting responsibly. And, um, and we were in correspondence for, for many months, and, and, and at which point I reached out to Glenn and, and Barton Gelman. Um, and one of the, I think the things that were, the, the balances be, that we had to make were that as independent journalists, I was very committed to make sure that we were going to report. I mean, I think Glenn and I both were very aware of the, the suppression of some stories that had happened in the past, particularly the New York Times failure to publish James Risen's story about the warrantless wiretapping. And we were, we were absolutely committed that if a source was taking the kind of risks that, that this source was taking, that we would not let that repeat and that we were going to publish no matter what. But we also needed to do this with newsrooms. And then we began a process of, of building relationships so that we could, we could do the reporting and have the institutional support that we needed, and yet make sure that we were in control of how, that to make sure that the, the reporting actually happened. 
Um, I think as a, as a journalist or as an independent journalist, I mean, the, the, the greatest, there were, there were many benefits of working this way. There were also incredible risks, particularly um, the, the risks of legal exposure. And I think that we've seen, you know, the U.S. government, as Amy was saying, going after journalists at unprecedented um, levels and then particularly trying to peel off journalists who will have protection and those who, who would not have protection. So to try to separate the mainstream from people who are doing uh, journalism in a more independent way. So myself as a documentary filmmaker or bloggers and, and the rights that they have and the protections in terms of working on a story um, with these kinds of high stakes. I think in terms of doing the... the the, the, the most complicated time of, of doing the work was right before heading to, to Hong Kong, where I had several meetings um, in New York about what the risks might be. And this was right before Glenn came. And, and one of the most you know, frightening moments was when the Washington Post, they were going to actually go, and Barton Gellman was going to go, and then they decided to pull out at the last minute because they were concerned about some of the, what the, some of the risks would be for them, and then having to, to navigate this sort of path of how to continue to sort of go forward with the journalism. And this is where, uh, you know, working with Glenn was an extraordinary um, uh, partnership because he, I mean, his sort of, his fearlessness throughout this was... Um, I think, um, I think had the most impact in terms of how the reporting uh, unfolded. I'm gonna, so this is a- I'm just gonna show you one slide here because uh, Laura thought it was valuable. This is in I was Hong talking Kong. about kind of how <clears throat> these uh, capabilities ramp up in sophistication over time. And this is kind of nice. As of fiscal year 2011, they could monitor one billion telephone or internet sessions simultaneously per one of these devices. This Here's all needs to get out, you know what I mean? It's like, it, it just in terms of understanding yeah, yeah. the capabilities, like it, it's so okay. It's not science fiction. This stuff is happening right no, now. No, that's what I mean. Yeah. It's like the, the magnitude of it, and, and like this is a pretty inaccessible technical document, <laughs> but even this like is really chilling. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah, I mean, we should have we should be having debates about whether we want government to do. I mean, this is massive and extraordinary. It's it's amazing. Yeah. Even though you know it, you know, even though you know that to see it like the physical blueprints of it mm -hmm. and sort of the technical expressions of it really hits home in like a, a super visceral way that yeah. is so needed. This is CNN Breaking News. An explosive new report is reigniting uh, the concerns that your privacy is being violated to protect America's security. It reveals a court order giving the National Security Agency a blanket access to millions of Verizon customers' records on a daily basis. Earlier I had the... So, um, so this was Glenn's first story that he reported um, in Hong Kong uh, two days after we first met with Snowden. And he writes about it in his book. And this was this, a story that the Guardian was getting pushback from the government saying, you should hold, back, you should hold that story, you should not publish that. And Glenn was on the phone uh, with his editors and said, if you won't publish this, then I will go elsewhere. And th this is why this story came out at, at, at this time when we were still in Hong Kong. And I think that the, the way that we didn't actually play by the rules that the mainstream media had done up until then, holding stories, um, and delaying the publication, trying to sort of take the impact out of the stories it didn't happen in this case. And I think that it impacted how, how this, um, the information was perceived. So, um, I mean, w one of the things that we, d we did confront was um, was a, was a massive government backlash that was directed at us individually um, and at the, uh, the publishers. And it was most aggressive in the, in the UK when we had the, the um, GCHQ and the government going into the office of the Guardian and having them physically destroy source material, which was, uh, f I think, as journalists, probably the most shocking thing I've ever experienced to see a government that would do that and, 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 and to have an, a news organization be, you know, entered into and, and have and have this kind of information destroyed. Um,
Mr. Snowden has been charged with very serious crimes, and he should be returned to the United States where he will be granted full due process and uh, every right available to him as a United States citizen uh, facing our justice system under the Constitution. No, I don't think Mr. Snowden was a patriot. I called for a thorough review of our surveillance operations before Mr. Snowden made these leaks. My preference, and I think the American people's preference, would have been for a lawful, orderly examination of these laws, a uh, thoughtful, fact-based debate, uh, that would then lead us to a better place. Oh my God. David. No, my baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, I, I actually, I think I'll, I'll probably stop with that, with those images and, and, and just give my you know, enormous thanks for this honor. It's, it's incredible privilege and to be in such company um, with Amy. And, and thank you so much.